Peter Marquez is a professor at McMaster University and a staff nephrologist at St. Joseph's Hospital in Hamilton, Ontario. He received both MD and PhD degree from McMaster University and has a clinical practice that involves general nephrology, chronic kidney disease, and dialysis, with a special interest in peritoneal dialysis. Dr. Marquez has research interests in peritoneal dialysis and chronic renal disease. Specifically, he is interested in the process of scarring and fibrosis and is investigating novel mechanisms of kidney and peritoneal injury, biomarkers of fibrosis, and potential novel treatments. He runs a basic research laboratory and is a member of the Hamilton Center for Kidney Research. Currently, Dr. Maggie Larche holds the position of Associate Professor, Divisions of Rheumatology and Clinical Immunology and Allergy, Departments of Medicine and Pediatrics at McMaster University. She is past president of the Canadian Rheumatology Ultrasound Society and chair of the Hamilton Scleroderma Group. She completed her BSc and medical degree from the University of Bristol, followed by a PhD in rheumatology training at Imperial College London, UK, before immigrating to Canada in 2006. Her major clinical interest is in scleroderma and early inflammatory arthritis with research interests in cellular biomarkers and ultrasonographic and magnetic resonance imaging. Thank you very much. You may notice that there's two speakers, so we're still waiting for uh, Dr. Larche to come. And she's got all the important background information. So uh, I'm just going to jump into the middle of it. It won't make any sense what I'm going to say, but please feel free to ask questions. So what we're going to talk about today is a condition called systemic sclerosis, which is a very rare autoimmune rheum rheumatologic condition that affects multiple systems in the body. And I think, and what, I, what the purpose of this particular round is to talk about how that particular condition affects the kidneys. And Dr. Larche, when she does show up, is going to give you a nice overview of the particular condition. But I think what we'll do is just jump right in because we have a patient here with systemic sclerosis who had a uh, um, kidney-related involvement. So I think we'll just start with Tara, if we could, get you to come on up. Uh, Tara, I'm going to try and move the microphone over so it picks both of us up because I, uh, you're a little soft-spoken, just, like just like your nephrologist. So Tara's a geologist uh, who worked at the Sheffield Mines in Labrador, which is very exciting. Uh, the, um, you have uh, systemic sclerosis, and perhaps you could just give us a brief idea of how this all uh, came about? How did, how did it first present? Uh, I began to notice my hands began to get stiff on me, and gradually over a year and a half before I had the, the renal crisis, um, I was getting renals, and you can actually see it happening right now. <laughs> my fingers are going purple, um, and then my hand, my fingers began to curl, and then as that was happening, I was getting extremely fatigued, um, so just walking down the block was really difficult. Um, I was having breathing issues, and I was having acid reflux and uh, swallowing issues, and that's and, what I was noticing. And Tara, what, uh, how old were you when this, uh, when this all first started? I um, was about 29, 30 years old. Okay. And, and just as we're uh, going through this, Dr. Larche is here to uh, take over. Sorry. That's okay. Um, so uh, I'll just keep going for a little bit longer, and then uh, uh, Dr. Larche can uh, uh, join in. So, um, how, sorry, how old were you? I was about 29. 29. 29. So, that's, so that's pretty common. Uh, a lot of autoimmune diseases happen in that sort of age range, and more predominantly in females and males. So you fit the right demographics for it. Um, so, what did, what did your doctor say when you uh, told him about your symptoms? Um, when my doctor took a look at my hand, she said it looks like rheumatoid arthritis, and uh, she was going to have me go through um, x-rays and ultrasounds on my hands. Unfortunately, that was a week prior to when I had the renal crisis happen. And uh, she had taken my blood pressure, as she usually does, and it was in the normal range. 
So she said to me, oh, with my blood results, that I, I ended up looking healthy. So she wasn't very concerned about anything at the time. And can you tell us about the renal crisis? I ended up having, it all started with a migraine. And I have had migraines in the past. And uh, all of a sudden I went home. And usually the migraine after I throw up goes away. But as I was throwing up every half an hour to an hour, uh, it was getting worse. And so I, and I noticed that by the morning time, it got into the back of my head. And I was very disoriented. And I could feel my heart racing. And I just said to my mom, I was busy with my mom at the time, and I said, let's wait till the afternoon and see what happens. It's just probably a really bad headache. And that's when I went back to bed and I woke up eight days later in the hospital getting told that I had blood pressure that was 252 over 192 when I arrived at the hospital. And my creatinine was up into the 200s. And my kidney function uh, had gone to 60%. And my brain had swelled as a result of the blood pressure increase because of my kidneys. And that swelling caused me to have a migraine, which caused me to have a seizure, which my poor mother ended up finding me. And I didn't wake up from the seizure. So, and then I got told that I had scleroderma from the way my hands looked, the skin across my chest, and the skin around my mouth, and the, and the Raynaud syndrome. And I thought when I got told I had scleroderma, I was thinking, what the heck is that? <laughs> and uh, where did it come from? And that's when and all the doctors that I had, which were fantastic at St. Joe's, pieced everything together. So. <clears throat> and, and the scleroderma clearly affected your kidneys, and that was yes. sort of a catastrophic presentation. And it yep. clearly affects the skin in your hands with with the tightening of the skin and uh, scarring in the skin, yeah. the ray notes, which we can see that purplish discoloration of the fingers. Yeah. Um, other things, any problems with your lungs? Um, it's just the tightening across my chest causes my lungs to not be able to expand. Okay. Uh, so I can't get as much oxygen into my lungs. So I get shortness of breath by just doing normal activities. Um, the skin all down my legs is tight, so we're trying to get boots and socks on. I can't pull my legs up to get those on. Um, and along my hips, I can't bend down to pick things up. Walking is very difficult because of the swelling I get because of my kidneys not doing well. I get swelling in my feet and my ankles and my legs, so walking is... is quite difficult and the skin of my arms is also tightening so I can't raise them more than here to do anything. And also around my mouth, opening my mouth and eating is difficult. And also I have all the digestive issues so I have acid reflux. My stomach doesn't empty properly um, and I also can't swallow properly because all the muscles in my esophagus are very weak. So I have to be very careful when I'm eating and um, swallowing is, is a bit hard. So when I'm having issues right now after drinking some water, it's quite staying down very well right now. <laughs> it's deciding it wants to come back up again. <laughs> so those are all the fun things I have with this illness. <laughs> Thank you. That's a, that's a wonderful overview. And thanks for bringing in the purple fingers, too. That's very helpful. And it was something I forgot to mention with that night when I had the migraine. I wasn't peeing a lot at all. My bladder wasn't emptying very much. And I had some slight pain in the, in the sides um, as well. Um, so I'm, I'm Maggie Larcher. I'm really sorry I'm late. Um, and thank you for Dr. Margetts for covering for me. Um, I'm going to talk to you about the basics of scleroderma and then Dr. Margetz is going to spend 20 minutes or so talking particularly about the kidney aspects of scleroderma. Um, I'm a rheumatologist and rheumatologists deal with weird autoimmune diseases and autoimmune means your immune system is 
attacking itself, and that's what, uh, that's what we do. And I'd like to acknowledge my fellows, Dr. Sarah Ron and Dr. Faiza Kokar, who have made some of these slides with me. So the objectives of my small part today, in about 20 minutes or so, I'm going to describe some of the pathological processes in scleroderma and describe some of the effects that um, patients suffer from. We saw from Tara that there was a life-threatening uh, problem with Tara's kidneys in scleroderma renal crisis, it's called. There are two other aspects of scleroderma that uh, can kill patients quickly, uh, or at least can, can cause death in patients with scleroderma. One is when scleroderma can affect the lungs, and the other is when scleroderma can affect the heart. Um, and Tara, as we heard, showed signs that her, her kidneys packed up because of a new diagnosis of scleroderma. So we'll talk through some of the other manifestations as well. We saw the skin involvement in Tara's hands, and we'll talk through some of the other ones. Scleroderma means thick, tight skin. Sclero, hard, derma, skin, hard skin. And it was first, it's an ancient disease, first described by Hippocrates, so it's, it's, it's ancient, but it was only in 1945 that they, they realized that actually if you've got tight, hard skin in your fingers, you can also get that scarring in your lungs, your kidneys, your blood vessels, and so on, causing all sorts of uh, internal organ dysfunction. The pathogenesis, really, uh, there's a lot of debates. If you ask Dr. Ask what the pathogenesis is, it's all fibrosis, fibrosis, and more fibrosis. If you ask uh, immunologists, they say it's the disruption in the immune system that causes the fibrosis, that causes the problems. If you ask a, a vascular uh, person involved in va vascular um, biology, they'll, t they'll tell you it's the vascular dysfunction. So there are three main elements to what causes scleroderma. Um, and they all interact with each other. There's autoantibodies that form when the, their immune system is dysregulated. And that's partly why we rheumatologists see this disease, because we deal with the immune system going wrong and attacking itself. Um, the, the, the lung, sorry, the pulmonary hypertension, which is really a, a, a problem with the blood vessels in the lung that can kill patients, and the renal manifestations, the scleroderma renal crisis, are all thought to be mainly related to the fibrosis resulting from endothelial uh, activation. And then, of course, fibrosis is really scarring. We need scarring. We need to be able to heal a cut. But scarring occurs in organs and in a disrupted way in uh, scleroderma. This is just a simple schematic of how the, 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 the three things interplay and the circulating lymphocytes um, might be activated part, partly by the activated endothelial cells, which then activate fibroblasts and go on. So there's an interplay between the three uh, bits of the fibrosis, immune activation, and endothelial activation. And of course, environment and uh, genetics all come into this. And, and actually, Tara, I might ask you in a minute to, to talk about some environmental exposure that may be related to Tara's case, and we're, Tara and I are fighting at the moment to, to try and get that recognized. But, um, well, actually, while I'm on it, um, Tara, do you mind standing up and telling us what, uh, what you worked at and uh, what your exposure was up north? Or, sorry, love. Sorry. It's okay. <laughs> I'm a, a geologist. I worked for eight years at the Institute of Duck in the Iron Ore Mine. And in there, we were in handling iron ore dust. And in that iron ore dust is silica. And we were never told that it could affect us or cause scleroderma or anything that was wrong. And all we provided with were dust masks, and we were told that it was for convenience sake if it was bubble mass. Um, I did not know that when you get around silica, you need to have an N95 mask, properly fitted. Didn't know that we had to have uh, procedures in place to deal with our clothes, to deal with washing, uh, cleaning, anything like that, or, or how to be around this dust. 
thoughtfully, and that's where we believe I got this illness from because the symptoms began to show up uh, about a couple of years after I got exposed to that filter test. Yeah. And this isn't dust that we all think of as dust in our living room, right? It's not just a little bit of dust that you see in your living room. It's proper dust, right? You, were, you had clouds of this stuff around you. And, uh, and the, the, the real challenge with the environmental triggers is that it can often happen years and years after exposure. And you say, I'm not sure if I can link this, but there's a very clear link. The first one I've got here on my list of environmental exposures is silica. Thank you, Tara. So don't forget about environmental um, toxins too. So what about the immune system? Um, I'm not sure how much immunology you've done, but I'll just do a really very quick uh, um, update on innate versus adaptive immunity. The innate immune system involves um, phagocytes and natural killer cells amongst other cells and the complement pathway. And those things um, occur super quickly. They're designed to act very quickly in order to get an immune reaction to whatever trigger it is. And those occur, as you see in the bottom timeline there, across the bottom here, within hours. The adaptive immune system occurs within days, and that allows your body to then generate a memory of what's gone on and what they've had a reaction, and now we've got a memory to this. And now, if I've previously had flu, I can now attack the flu virus, right? That's the whole point of the adaptive immune response. The innate is hardwired, it's fast acting, and it's your superman here. Whereas your adaptive is it's able to learn and remember, and it's slower. And these are all the other guys who come in after Superman's been in. Anybody? Uh, anyway. Um, what, what, do the, what does the adaptive immune system do? Well, it, it essentially starts um, the process to destroy an intruder, OK? And that's the whole point of an adaptive immune response. You get a bacterial infection in your finger and your immune response comes in and says, okay, let's destroy this. And then it remembers. The next time you get the same, like I said, flu, if, you, if you've got flu for the second time, your memory cells, your, your B cells and T cells that are, have, the, have the memory can then attack. What goes wrong in autoimmunity it, Partly what goes on in autoimmunity is that your cells can be non-intruders, so not uh, toxic or, or um, causing trouble, but they get labeled as an intruder and they get an immune reaction to them. So what we measure in the blood of patients with autoimmune diseases is this ANA, anti-nuclear antigen. And what is an anti-nuclear antigen? It's a protein that, uh, for, that is expressed on the nucleus of the cell. And we can measure that by uh, the, the test here on the, on the left of the screen here, which is an immunofluorescence. So what they do is they put cells on a plate. And they, um, so they put human cells on a plate, which have a nucleus, right? And then they add my serum, and if they add my serum neat to this, my serum will have antibodies in it that will attach to the nucleus. They then dilute that serum, one in 40, one in 80, one in 160, so they're called serial half dilutions. And if I'm still showing a positive at, say, one in 160 dilution, then that's a positive test. Now, what is that more than 90% of people with scleroderma have a positive ANA test. So there's some immune dysregulation there. And there are particular types of the ANA. If we break down what, what parts of the nucleus they're looking at, we, we call these extractable nuclear antigens. And there are three main extractable nuclear antigens that we measure in scleroderma. There are anti-SCL70, anti-centromere, and anti-RNA polymerase 3 as you see in the column, the first column here. And they can be associated with different disease phenotypes. I've told you scleroderma means thick, tight skin. If you have limited skin involvement up to your elbows, up to your knees from distal to proximal, um, we call that limited cutaneous systemic sclerosis. If you have skin involvement, including the chest, 
all the way up your legs, all the way up your arms. Um, that's called diffuse, which Tara has. And the different antibodies make you more prone to different manifestations of scleroderma. Having said that, a positive ANA or a positive ENA doesn't equal scleroderma, and you need all the symptoms or some of the symptoms to help you make that diagnosis. The terminology is horrible. I'm not going to talk much about um, localized scleroderma, which is really only localized to the skin, or there's then systemic sclerosis, which Tara has, and Tara has the diffuse type of systemic sclerosis. I don't mean you to write all this down or, or take notes on all of this. I just mean this slide to tell you that it can affect almost every organ. It doesn't usually affect the brain unless, like Tara's case, you have such bad hypertension or high blood pressure that you get uh, seizures and um, need to be in a medically induced coma. So it, it can affect any organ, apart, really, really apart from the brain. Um, and I'm going to talk about some of those in a bit more detail. Not everyone gets every symptom or every complication. And the outcome can be very variable. Some people have just skin involvements that, that um, troubles them. They get contractures of their fingers. But actually, over years and years and years, they do not get the life-threatening complications. Other people like Tara present with the, with the most significant life-threatening complication. And then... Um, the skin might ease off after a few years and, and then leads a healthy life. That's what we're planning, isn't it, Tara? So it's a really, as, as you can probably hear in, in Tara's voice, it's a really emotional diagnosis. It's a roller coaster. It can be months to years of symptoms before you're diagnosed. You were uh, not in that category. But there are loads of questions. What causes it? Did I do something wrong? What did I do to get this? How can I get rid of it? What can I do to help myself? I don't want medications, that's hideous. And then what about the future? And that, that, that's the most difficult one to answer in clinic. What about the future? I don't know. I do know some of the antibodies that might predict what's going to happen in the future, but in general, I don't really know. Raynaud's, anybody in the room got Raynaud's? I do. Cold white fingers. You go out in the cold in Canadian winter, minus 40, and you get white fingers like... Like this, this is an archetypal example of the white, well-demarcated fingers that you get. Or you can get blue discoloration. Are your fingers unusually sensitive to cold? I think anybody in the room in Canada has unusually sensitive fingers to cold. But do they change color? Do they change white, blue, red? Okay, bi or triphasic color change. Primary ray nodes is not associated with any other connective tissue disease. It often begins in adolescence or, or at puberty. And all you really need to do is take a good history, i.e., have you got features of lupus or scleroderma or anything else that might give you a hint that it's not primary ray nodes. And you don't usually have to do any blood work and really don't need to do anything. Secondary ray nodes is what I see every day in my clinical practice. It's associated with connective tissue diseases or autoimmune diseases. It can be associated with other things like young men who smoke um, have this weird uh, condition called thromboangiitis obliterans that gives you similar ray nodes. Um, and it can be associated with other diseases which I've listed there. But you see at the bottom of the 90% of patients with scleroderma have ray nodes. And I use this expensive magnifying glass with a light to look at where the skin joins the nail right here we're right at the cuticle there, and what we see in normal individuals are um, little, lovely little discrete blood vessels which are calm. Patients with scleroderma have these massively dilated nail fold capillaries. You see the difference between A and B? Really marked, and, and by this little microscope with a um, magnifying glass with a light, I can see these things, and then you can get hemorrhages and dropouts. So these B, C, and D are all abnormal, but A is normal. What else do patients get? We already heard from Tara that she gets short of breath. She, she used to be a geologist working in the fields, literally hiking up mountains, hiking up stairs, you know, she, and now she gets short of breath. The shortness of breath can be several, related to several things. She, Tara has tightness across the, her chest, so actually 
Taking a deep breath in is difficult, right? So it can be just skin tightness that, that causes the lung, um, the, the shortness of breath, but it can also be scarring in the lung tissue itself, and that's called pulmonary fibrosis. Or it can be a high blood pressure in the, in the right side of the heart, it's called pulmonary hypertension. Um, those two things are, are life-threatening complications of, of scleroderma, and um, are actually treatable now. What tests do we do for this condition? We, do, um, we can do ECG and echo, looking for signs of um, pulmonary hypertension, too much pressure on the right side of the heart. And we can do lung function tests. And somebody like Tara, early on in the disease, will be doing those every six to 12 months tests just to keep an eye on her lungs and heart. What about treatment of pulmonary fibrosis? Well, we do have good treatments now that can maintain the disease as it is. We don't have any treatments that can reverse it, but we have treatments that can maintain it. We can do simple measures like reducing GERD or gastroesophageal reflux. Tara was complaining that actually the glass of water she had is kind of coming back up, and that's very, very common in scleroderma. And we can do, uh, we, can, we can help with the GERD because if you can imagine, if you're spilling acid, it's coming up from your stomach, and you're spilling it into your lungs, that can cause fibrosis itself, let alone having scleroderma causing the fibrosis. So we know that, so we should, we should help that. And then there are two main strategies of how to deal with the um, scarring in the lungs. We can use antifibrotics, which stop, try to stop the scarring, stop more and more scars forming, or we can use immunosuppressants, and it really it depends what type of pulmonary fibrosis you've got tells you which medications to use. What about treatment of pulmonary hypertension? That's the extra high blood pressure on the right side of your heart. Um, we know with, with better medications now, we've got improved survival of this condition, and there are a multitude of drugs that literally just open up the blood vessel in the, in the right side of that heart there. What about the gastric features? These are not usually life-threatening, although Dr. Margetz and I have shared a couple of patients with such severe gut involvements that um, unfortunately the patients haven't survived. But in general, the involvement is, is not so severe. It's very, very, as Tara can attest to, annoying. You've got a dry mouth. You can't actually speak without having a bottle of water right next to you. You've got difficulty swallowing, partly because you've got dryness in your mouth, partly because the muscles are all... So instead of, normally when I swallow, my esophagus will contract like this sequentially, squeezing the bolus of food down, and that's what happens in the rest of my gut. In scleroderma, you get scarring of the lining of the muscle in your, in your whole gut, or you can. That can cause difficulty swallowing. So people feel like they've got swallowed that food and it's just stuck right there and it's again really annoying can you imagine or you're trying to swallow and you choke 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 and your friends don't love going out for dinner with you anymore um, you feel full quickly you get bloated you get constipation diarrhea it's all because that muscle doesn't work properly in a in a beautifully sequential way and um Patients can even get incontinence of stool, which is, as you can imagine, an incredibly debilitating problem. I sent one 50-year-old man um, to the surgeons, and they can now insert, essentially, they insert a pacemaker into your sacral nerve, which helps control the anal sphincter, and that's really helped him with his incontinence problem, right? So there are things that we can do to help, and most of the GI support is, uh, it, GI treatment is supportive, so we help with the GERD, we help with the dry mouth, and so on. There's no good treatment for GI. Um, and then we'll move on to the kidney, because the kidney is really what we're talking about today, and Dr. Margatz is the expert here. Um, so in summary, we've got this aberrant immune response, there's too much collagen being deposited, there's fibrosis or scarring, but endothelial dysfunction and platelet activation all causing the pathology here. And each patient is different. There's a multitude of different symptoms that they can be complaining of. Blood work can be different in each patient, and we use a different combination of medicines. So thank you very much for your attention, and I'll hand over. Thank you. Okay, as uh, Dr. Larsay
mentioned, I am a kidney doctor. Uh, I work mostly over at St. Joe's, and I'm going to talk about the renal complications, which Tara clearly uh, has experienced and outlined. Uh, so here's your kidneys. You have two of them. Uh, they sit towards the back, and their main job is to filter your blood. And uh, they filter the blood, and they create urine, which uh, helps uh, adjust your internal milieu and your volume, and uh, turns it into urine. So the kidneys are actually very complex. I'm going to go through it very briefly. And they're very important, as uh, Tara has indicated. Uh, they, the diseases of the kidney clearly are life-threatening. And really, that's why uh, kidney doctors tend to be some of the smartest people that you'll find in the hospital because... <laughs> oh, sorry. So as I mentioned, they, their main job is to filter the blood. And we talk about a blood test called creatinine, which is an enzyme. Everybody has it in the blood, and it's filtered out by the kidneys. Uh, and we use that to calculate a glomerular filtration rate, and that's how much blood the kidneys are filtering every minute. Kidneys get rid of salt and water, that's what comes out in the urine, and they secrete a hormone called renin, which is, has to do with adjusting your blood pressure, and is absolutely critical in this particular condition. So here's a picture. So this is the uh, outer stripe of the kidney is called the cortex, and this is where all the business happens in the kidney, and it's filled with a million of these little filtration units called glomeruli. And the blood comes into the glomeruli, and they're really just a little tangle of blood vessel. And across the wall of the capillaries in the glomeruli, the filtrate is formed, and that's where the urine starts to form. Collected into these uh, tubules, and eventually drain down into the pelvis of the kidney and come out into the bladder. So there's the, uh, and, and the third component in the kidney is this vasculature, which is again going to be absolutely critical when we talk about the effect of scleroderma on the kidney. Uh, so if we take a glomerulus and the tubule that's attached to it, that's the functional unit of the kidney, and it's called the nephron. So here's the glomerulus, blood goes in, there's the little filtration, the urine gets formed here, and it starts its course down this tubule, down in this long loop that dips down into the medulla of the kidney, comes back up, and then eventually comes down and drains into the pelvis of the kidney. This is where the filtration happens, reabsorption happens in the proximal tubule, loop of Henle, which you probably remember from biology a few years ago, and you still don't understand how the heck it works. You either. There's a, a fine-tuning segment here, and then um, this is the most important part that we need to talk about for scleroderma and scleroderma renal crisis. The urine that's made in this glomerulus actually wraps around and comes right back by the two arteries, or uh, small arteries that are feeding the glomerulus. And there's a discussion between the urine, a tone within those arteries that regulates the filtration within the kidney. So here's a glomerulus. Here's that tubule that the urine formed here is going to wrap around and come back by the glomerulus. And there's a specialized group of cells within the tubule called the macula densa, and they sense the amount of urine. In fact, they sense the amount of chloride that this glomerulus is making. And they have a discussion with this group of cells, which is called the juxtaglomerular cells, or the juxtaglomerular apparatus. These cells listen to these cells, and they control the amount of filtration. So if you're making too much urine, they're going to slow down the production of urine by decreasing the pressure within the glomerulus and decreasing the filtration. If you're not making enough urine, they're going to try and open it up and try and increase the pressure within the glomerulus so you make more urine. And the main hormone that these cells make, which adjusts the filtration rate of the kidney, is called renin. <clears throat> so renin is made by the kidneys, and it's made under two states. If there's not enough urine being formed, or if the kidney is not getting enough blood supply. Remember, all this system is... Uh, um, <clears throat> was created at a time when we were being chased by saber-toothed tigers. So if you get bitten by a saber-toothed tiger, you're going to lose blood quite rapidly. And this system is in place to prevent you from dying from bleed if you've lost some blood from a saber-toothed tiger. So it's not good for scleroderma. Uh, the system fights against us in scleroderma, heart failure, a lot of other conditions the system doesn't work well for. But evolutionarily, it's an excellent system you from uh, dying of low blood volume after you've been bleeding. The kidneys sense that low blood volume and they 
renin, there's a hormone angiotensinogen made by the liver. And as an enzyme, it cleaves an angiotensinogen to angiotensin 1. Within the lungs, there's another enzyme called angiotensin converting enzyme. And it convert angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2. And it's got a whole plethora of actions. It's going to turn on your sympathetic nervous system, which is going to increase your blood pressure. And it's going to squeeze on the kidneys to, to try and slow down urine production. Uh, it tells the kidneys to reabsorb salt and water, so you're not going to lose more volume through the kidneys. It uh, creates aldosterone through the adrenal cortex, tells the blood vessels to squeeze to try and push your blood pressure up, <clears throat> and, uh, and also causes the reabsorption of water. So this whole system here is there to try and uh, uh, increase your blood pressure when your overall blood volume has been reduced. So scleroderma renal crisis is a rare complication of systemic sclerosis, and the features are hypertension, which Tara clearly outlined. Blood pressures are usually in the 220 over 120, and patients have multiple complications from that high blood pressure, and it is a true medical emergency. These people need to be seen and dealt with within uh, minutes to hours. Uh, it's also associated with decreased kidney function, uh, and it's also associated with cells and platelets in a process we call microangiopathic hemolytic anemia or microangiopathic hemolysis. So here's the, what happens is the primary pathologic step is endothelial cell injury. What, what causes that, we don't know. Uh, Complement, uh, Dr. Larche mentioned the immune system is involved with this. Could be the uh, adapt, innate immune system and complement might be involved in this. It could be the adaptive immune system. There's been measured antibodies against endothelin or various components of the endothelial cells. But the endothelial cells, which line all of your blood vessels, are injured primarily in the kidney. This leads to, uh, they start to um, proliferate, and this narrows the lumen. So you have decreased blood going to that juxtaglomerular apparatus in the kidney. The kidney does not like that, and it starts to create that uh, hormone called renin, the renin causes that whole cascade and angiotensin gets formed and that causes hypertension and the hypertension causes endothelial cell injury, which causes it. And you can probably see at this point where this is all going to go on because this is going to keep going round and round and round until people go into kidney failure. They have uh, malignant hypertension and will eventually cause death. <clears throat> Here's the uh, uh, experiment we did several years ago. Uh, Dr. Geyer, who's a, uh, a PhD student in my lab, did these experiments with a mouse model of endothelial cell injury. This is the, so this is that this portion of the glomerulus here, and we're looking at it under electron microscope. On the outside of this capillary loop uh, is a very um, intricate cell called the podocyte, which wraps around the, the capillary loop and is part of the filtration barrier. Inside is the blood system, and this, these large black things are uh, red cells. So the blood's here, and the urine's being formed here. And aligning the inside of the capillary are the endothelial cells. You can actually see there's these very fine little uh, holes within the uh, endothelium. So these are very specialized endothelial cells. They're called fenestrated endothelium. They've got holes in them to allow a lot of stuff to filter across there so we can make a lot of urine. In our model, we caused injury to the endothelium. You can see these cells start to swell up, and they actually start to create this extra material between the cell and the basement membrane. And closing, you can see the lumen becomes narrowed within that. So that's an endothelial cell injury, which is happening with the glomerulus. <clears throat> Elsewhere in the kidney, the same process happens. So this is a normal kidney here. Here's a glomerulus over here. Here's those tubules. Here's a blood vessel within the kidney, an arteriole, and these are the endothelial cells lining it. So that's normal. Uh, abnormally, those endothelial cells start to swell up. They start to proliferate. They fill in the hole, and you're squeezing a little bit of uh, blood through there, and you're decreasing the blood flow to the rest of the kidney. The, the kidney is also quite remarkable because it has a two sets of uh, capillaries in series, so that this is a, the glomerulus is a tangle of capillaries or little blood vessels, and then there's a portal uh, 
uh, vein that goes to a second capillary system which wraps around all the tubules and supplies blood and oxygen and nutrients to the tubules. So if you start to injure, injure the blood vessels here, here, and here, you can see what's going to happen to the rest of this nephron is no longer going to have sufficient blood supply. It's going to become hypoxic. It's going to die off, and eventually you'll get scarring. You're going to lose some of the filtration units of the kidney, and at the end of the day, if we happen to treat this appropriately and we can fix the problem and get people through it, as we did Tara, she's still going to be left with decreased kidney function, which she was telling me about earlier, because she's had scarring within the kidneys through this pr particular process. <clears throat> so um, for scleroderma renal crisis, I mentioned severe hypertension, renal failure, and hemolysis. We see it in about 10 to 15 percent of patients with diffuse uh, scleroderma, which means scleroderma affecting more than just the distal part of the uh, arms and legs. And it's very rare in limited form of scleroderma. Uh, it's associated with full-on kidney failure requiring dialysis in about half the patients who prevent, present. Tara was lucky. She was uh, treated fairly early for this. She was treated with, appropriately with the right medications, and she avoided having to go on to dialysis. Interestingly, about a third of the people who get kidney failure and go on to dialysis Eight to ten months after that, they start to make urine and their kidney starts to recover to the point where they can come off dialysis. And certainly this condition is seen in patients who have worse scleroderma, which means more rapidly progressive uh, scleroderma. Here's some of the risk factors. And, uh, for, so this is a group of patients with scleroderma renal crisis. This is a group of patients without scleroderma renal crisis. And you can see that uh, things like pulmonary hypertension, and cardiac involvement is more, more common in the patients who do get scleroderma renal crisis. Interestingly, a history of being given prednisone, which is one of the immune suppressing drugs we used to use a lot, uh, is those patients are more likely to get scleroderma renal crisis and uh, also in diffuse disease. Okay, I'm going to talk about treatment, but before we get there, we'll start with a snake. Anybody know what this one is? It is the Brazilian pit viper. Uh, and it has a venom, so they, it bites small animals. And one thing it does is the animals that get bitten, their blood pressure drops quite dramatically. So within the venom, there's all sorts of other things within the venom, but it has a peptide which causes the victim's blood pressure to drop dramatically. And <clears throat> the peptide actually blocks this enzyme right here, the angiotensin-converting enzyme. And about 60 years ago, scientists were working on this, figured out about this uh, enzyme, angiotensin converting enzyme, and they had a brilliant thought that perhaps they should make a drug that blocks that, and if they could block that, they could block all these uh, side effects from angiotensin, including blood pressure. Uh, and in 1981, they, um, uh, bristol Myers Squibb uh, patented a drug called Captopril, uh, and its sister drug is called Enalapril, which is the one Tara was explaining that she was on, and, in fact, they did a randomized control trial. This came out in 1987 in the New England Journal of Medicine. Because if you think about it, people with heart failure have low blood flow to the kidneys, and all this system gets turned on in patients with heart failure. So this would be an, a wonderful treatment for this uh, to reverse all the side effects of angiotensin. And, in fact, it is very effective and has revolutionized the treatment of heart failure in patients. This clinical trial showed that in severe heart failure, you have to treat six people for six months to prevent one death. So that's a very potent uh, medical intervention. It's also a very potent medical intervention for people with scleroderma renal crisis. This uh, researcher looked at all of her charts back uh, from before ACE inhibitors or this captopril or an allopril drug was available and uh, to a group of patients who had been given this medication uh, and she saw that the survival is dramatically different. They never did a randomized control trial because it's a very rare condition. So, uh, in fact, in the hierarchy of medical evidence, we're down here in the cohort study, and we know that randomized control trial would be much better evidence. But we've got a rare condition, very difficult to do these randomized control trials, and, um, and some would say it's uh, unethical to take somebody like Tar and say, well, we're going to ask her mom if she'll go into this clinical trial. We'll give her, give her this drug, which... You know, it looked, it looked pretty good in, um, uh, in, in a cohort study, but maybe she won't get it. We'll randomly assign her to this. Uh, and in fact, there certainly is some interventions in medicine that we 
uh, do that we had, do not have randomized control trial events for. This came out in the British Medical Journal. This is a parachute used to prevent death and major trauma when jumping from aircraft, a randomized control trial. So how many people would sign up for this one? Because you have 50-50 chance. You might get the parachute. You might get an empty uh, knapsack. <clears throat> it was a joke study. And in fact, uh, the only way they could run the study and have people actually enroll in this is to tell them they didn't have to jump very far. So this was, this was their intervention. Since the introduction of uh, ACE inhibitors, so these are cohorts of patients with scleroderma, and this is what their cause of death is. And in the 1970s, the majority of patients died from scleroderma renal crisis, and over time, with the introduction of ACE inhibitors for treating this, the rate of the cause of death from uh, scleroderma renal crisis has gone down dramatically. The uh, risk of death from pulmonary fibrosis continues to increase. So <clears throat> the, our, um, our lung doctors need to get on their, uh, on their game and try and fix that. Uh, I'll skip that for the sake of time. And we'll jump to, um, we have no way to prevent this. Uh, giving patients ACE inhibitors before they get scleroderma re renal crisis is not being shown to pre be preventive. In fact, pe patients who are on a preventive dose before, uh, if they do get scleroderma renal crisis, their outcome is actually worse, probably because they're waiting longer uh, before they actually get treated because their blood pressure is somewhat under control and they don't, they don't have the dramatic presentation that Tara did. The only thing we can suggest to patients is uh, if they are high risk for scleroderma renal crisis, which means rapidly progressive scleroderma, uh, um, diffuse scleroderma, certain of the autoantibodies like RNAs, RNA polymerase 3 put you at high risk, we would suggest buying one of these blood pressure cuffs and watching your blood pressure, cuff, uh, blood pressure carefully at home, which Tara tells me she does every day religiously. <clears throat> Here's the outcomes for patients with scleroderma renal crisis. Uh, Victoria Steen has probably the largest cohort, and you can see that uh, um, uh, about a, uh, almost half the patients in the cohort ends up on dialysis. Uh, some of them temporarily, and some of them get off uh, dialysis. The um, mortality rate at five years is quite variable, somewhere between 20 and 30 percent. So, to summarize, um, scleroderma renal crisis uh, is the most common renal complication of scleroderma, but it's actually a very rare complication overall. Its it, pathologic mechanism is endothelial uh, injury, and then it turns on this whole lack of blood flow to the kidney, which ends up with this renin secretion, high blood pressure, and this vicious cycle, which, uh, which can rapidly uh, progress to death. Early diagno diagnosis and treatment is crucial. The only uh, prevention we have is blood pressure monitoring. Uh, it really is a medical emergency. It requires patients to end up in the intensive care unit with uh, intravenous blood pressure lowering medications. As I mentioned, ACE inhibitor therapy is absolutely is essential. Half the patients will end up on dialysis, and a third will recover enough renal function to become independent of dialysis. I've got one minute left. This is uh, Paul Klee. He was an uh, Impressionist artist for, from the early part of the 20th century. He did these lovely small prints. I've seen some of them at the Guggenheim in uh, New York. They're very colorful. And this is him later in life, and you can see the characteristic changes of scleroderma in his hands and his face. And he died at age 60 of complications of scleroderma. This is one of his last uh, paintings he did in the last year of his art uh, uh, life. He actually had 10, over 10,000 works of art over the course of his um, career. But this, in the middle, you can see the word T-O-D, which is German for death. And this is a hymn marching towards death. And uh, this is one of his more famous pa paintings uh, in the pointless style. So we'll take any questions. We've got one whole minute. And Tara's still here if you have any questions for her. <clears throat> 